Hi, Misha here, and want to talk about the Supercut Jaguar again. If you do, great. If you don't, tough shit. That's what we're doing. Actually, that's not true. I would appreciate it if you stay with me. I know I've talked about this before, but I have a new model, and I feel like talking about it. Plus, I'm waiting on FedEx, so why not? So I've laid out again four you've seen before. These are all the versions used by the British RAF, starting with the original GR1 ground attack reconnaissance mark 1 moving over to the uh, trainer mark 2 slash trainer mark 4 T2 T4 now the new model the one I picked up during Aiken's recent house cleaning sale this is the GR1A which was the first upgrade version and it's from Operation Granby which was the RAF's part in um, the 1991 Gulf War, what America would call Desert Storm. So it's pretty neat. I'm actually very pleased about it. And then the later versions, we have the GR3 and the GR3A. And it's kind of fun because this GR1 is a model of the, essentially the first one, at least publicly shown off. And this uh, GR3 over here is a model of how it ended its service over 30 years later in 2007. So it kind of runs the gambit with the Desert Storm one being right in the middle, which is kind of fitting because that was perhaps the aircraft's career highlight. So yeah. I don't know. Let's just talk about it. By the way, these are all 172 scale die cast metal from Corgi. And I know I have uh, shown you this model before, so if you want to skip ahead to my new one, the GR1A, I wouldn't blame you. But with that, let's start with the T2 slash T4, the two seater here, because that's kind of where the design began. As you know, this was one of the first and earliest successful joint British French projects. Breguet and uh, BAC signed an agreement in 1965. This would lead to the formation of Seaprocot as a company the next year and work would begin on designing the first prototype of the Jaguar. And actually the original prototype, the first one to fly in September of 68, was a two-seater. And that's because back then the primary mission, the primary goal of this aircraft was as a trainer. Now, the British wanted an advanced supersonic trainer, whereas the French wanted an affordable, cheap-to-operate subsonic trainer, and they wanted it to have a secondary attack role. The British weren't too concerned about attack at the time because they were planning on Servicing, uh, serving the the uh, the F one oh excuse me the F one hundred eleven K Ardvark as their primary ground attack close air close air support aircraft, but because the French had the requirement and because the British often hedged their bets by having at least two plans, they decided giving the new aircraft a secondary attack strike close air support capability. Hey, not a bad idea. So the first prototype flew, and then work would begin on the single-seat version. And then in 1970, things started to change. This is when the F-111 was officially canceled, so the backup became the primary close air support around the TAC aircraft for the RAF. And each country ordered around 200. The, the French would order 160 single-seaters and 40 two-seaters. The British would order 165 single-seaters and 38 two-seaters. And of these 38 two-seaters, 34 would go into the RAF, with four being held back for trials and testing at places like the Royal Air Aircraft Establishment, RAE. So forward kind of kept back for government testing and, and what have you. 
So 199 would serve in the RAF. And they would use the uh, the T2, as it was first known, as a uh, as an advanced trainer. But it was fully combat uh, capable, like the single seater. It had a total of five hard points, two under each wing, one under the fuselage. The uh, single seat version had two cannon. The twin seater has one cannon. And obviously the two-seater is a little bit uh, longer to accommodate a, a longer nose. Funnily enough, uh, DeSalt took over around 1971, and they, they actually pushed, instead of working on the Jaguar further, just, hey, just, just buy the Mirage F1. But the British didn't go for this, and the, the Supercut Jaguar continued and it was in full production throughout the 70s. And the last ones would come off the line around 1981. They would ultimately build nearly 550. So, pretty good production. And it was an des airplane designed to carry a reasonably heavy payload. Also be capable of a short field takeoff and landing. Rough fields. The British version was designed with terrain following radar, also a laser system for striking the ground. It was basically designed for low-level flight. And with that, we'll get in to the GR series. As I said, this is a recent model. It just came out last year, and I did a video on it. But it's a neat one, because this is essentially the first... RAF GR1 from the rotor rotorways the the motorways test in 1975. It was a demonstration to show it could take off from a, a, well a motorway a highway interstate type and land and then quickly be refueled rearmed and take off again. Just showing the front line utility of this because that's what it was designed for once it became Britain's primary aircraft. This was designed to be in Europe and able to strike targets coming in low, quick, strike targets beyond range into the Soviet lines, be it nuclear or conventional, as well as come in quickly to support troops. So it needed to be able to fly from nearby airfields or mud, dirt strips, what have you. <laughs> It also had the kind of a third role as a reconnaissance, tactical reconnaissance craft. So they would uh, begin, begin putting these into service in the mid and late 70s. Now they would be assembled in the UK by BAC, but uh, Breguet in France would, well I guess Dassault now in France would provide a number of the parts and they would have their own production line. So each country would assemble their Jaguars, but the parts were kind of a single source. And the French Jaguar uh, was, was pretty different, at least in the details, because of different needs. And France would use theirs pretty early on, pretty quickly in Africa. The UK, on the other hand, would mostly station theirs in Europe. At the strength, there were eight squadrons. Four were, were nuclear strike. Three were traditional strike or close air support, and one was a, was a recce squadron. Now, the first upgrade came in 1981. The French version used the Mark 101 engine. The British version, from the outset, used the Mark 102, which had an improved, more efficient afterburner. But in 81, they went to the new Mark 104 engine. These were still GR1s, but two years later, in 1983, they would introduce the GR1A. And this was basically a systems upgrade. So we will uh, talk about that in a minute with the new model. But it is worth saying that the uh, Jaguar started to be replaced beginning in 84 as the Tornado GR1 came into service. 
but it never was a complete thing. But it did reduce the number of active squadrons down to three by the late 80s. It was always an interim aircraft and one pressed into service, but it did very well for what it was. It was a little over 55 feet long for the single seat version and nearly 57 and a half feet long for the two seater. Had a nice and short wingspan of about 28 and a half feet. Had this uh, moving tail as I've shown in the model. It's kind of neat. It could carry up to 10,000 pounds. It has five hard points. Originally, it had uh, the ability to carry iron bombs, rocket pods, some guided air-to-surface miss missiles like anti-radiation. Of course, it would be upgraded and have its weapons increased over time. The center and inboard pylons are plumbed for up to three drop tanks. The outer pylons are not, but they can support uh, AIM-9 Sidewinder missiles, which the RAF was beginning to use by the 1970s. And these were for air defense. They also had two 30mm cannon with up to 150 rounds per gun. Again, for more of the close air support use. And they were designed to be uh, pretty rugged and dependable. They were reasonably fast. They could get up to Mach 1.1 at low altitude and up to 1.6 at high. So not a speed demon, but they didn't need to be. And their max altitude was about 45,000 feet. Again, this was a low-level aircraft. It didn't need to go, but it could get up high enough for most uh, purposes. And it was a good thing for the RAF because without this, they would have had a big uh, gap since the 10, I keep calling it the 101, the, the 111 never came to be. And it was a pretty affordable one too. The, the project was pretty much on time and budget, and no real craziness happening there. Yeah, but this is a neat model from Corgi. The, uh, the bombs are removable because of the motorway test. One neat thing to point out about it, since this was uh, an early version and it was for public trials, the uh, the gun ports are uh, plated over, or at least plugged for safety. But otherwise, it's a pretty standard RAF plane. The GR... Mark 1A. And the reason I really wanted to do this video, because this is my latest Jaguar model, and probably my favorite. This one is uh, done up for Operation Granby. January, February of 1991. Iraq, Kuwait, that area. But backing up a bit. In 1983, the 1A program began, and as I said, production had recently ended, so they would be updating existing airframes. They would pick 75 GR1s and 14 T2s to update to A's, and this was mostly an electronics thing. They went to a new navigation system that had inertial navigation. They went to a new computer and uh, power source and a few other avionics updates as well as some weapons targeting updates that kind of uh, that kind of thing moving forward after the program it was considered uh, when the tornado was in full service and at this time in the late 80s they thought the typhoon the Eurofighter would be coming soon. It was considered to go ahead and retire the Jaguar. But this didn't get too far before the incident in Iraq. I mean, their, their invasion of Kuwait. So in 1990, the GR-1A was updated again. It received a new radar warning system. It was more effective 
make a better uh, threat display. And these aircraft received the overwing pylons to carry two AIM-9 Sidewinders. It might seem a little odd to have missiles over the wings. This was originally created, designed, developed by Supercat for an export order. But it freed up two underwing hardpoints, which is important. Another thing they did to free up hardpoints, they went to kind of a double tandem bomb rack here, you just see in this model, freeing the outer pylons for chaff, flare, and ECM pods. Meaning basically the two inner pylons carried bombs. Now the center line would carry a single fuel tank, but since this is on the stand, I can't install it. It does come with the fuel tank. So this was the configuration they went to war with. The, the first 12 were sent to the Gulf in August of 1990, along with the 12 tornadoes, and they would operate together. And at first that would seem to be it, but in January, he was decided that the good old Blackburn Buccaneer shouldn't miss the party. So the first six were sent with uh, all of three days notice. And the, and the Buccaneers were sent to support these mostly because they had uh, laser designation pods. The um, Jaguar here had uh, the ability to use a laser to target something but could not designate itself for itself at the time. So the Buccaneers came in to designate for tornadoes and Jaguars. The uh, Jaguar would fly many combat missions and there would not be one lost uh, there would be some tornadoes lost, and uh, in many ways, people liked the Jaguar. It was uh, more dependable, more reliable. Obviously, it was more survivable just based on statistics. But the Tornado was not without its virtues. For its part, it was more advanced, could carry more advanced weapons, more weapons, a heavier payload. And it was, generally speaking, more user-friendly, had a more ergonomic cockpit, more modern displays more systems, so it was a more advanced aircraft. One thing that came out of the Gulf War, the Jaguar's retirement was put on hold. It proved itself very well. It, it had a good success rate. It was economical to operate, and by this point, 92 or so, the Eurofighter Typhoon was hitting uh, road bumps because of the end of the uh, Cold War. This is in the uh, desert camo they gave these. It kind of was a pinkish, brownish, yellowish for a few reasons. It seemed to be an interesting color, especially after it got bleached in the sun. But yeah, this one's uh, loaded out. It's worth pointing out that France sent Jaguars to the Gulf too, but theirs didn't get the cool over-the-wing missiles, so they weren't as cool as the British ones. So far from deciding to retire the Jaguar, they were used for various operations to enforce no-fly zones in the Middle East and what have you. And then in 1994, it was decided to retire the Buccaneer and transfer its duties to the remaining Jaguar squadrons and to give them another round of updates and modernizations, which is where we get to the GR3 series. In 1995, the RAF conducted a bit of an experiment. They selected a dozen GR-1As to be updated to the GR-1B. And basically this was fitting it with the laser designator pod, formerly used by the uh, Buccaneer. And they would not wait long to try these out in the field. They would be used over Bosnia in what was the first time the RAF had bombed European soil since World War uh, One War Two, And they would designate for the uh, new, at the time, GR-7 Harrier. And uh, the whole program was wildly successful. 
Thus, the Plan 96 program began. And this was to update the GR1, especially its um, cockpit, and to allow it to take the reconnaissance pod, and just, uh, you know, other little midlife things of that nature. These would begin in 1997. And the whole idea for the upgrade program was to have two phases. That was phase one. Phase two was plan 97. And this would be more extensive. It would allow it to take a new version of a reconnaissance pod that was fully digital. And went to a new helmet. The, uh, the 96 had a new heads-up display. The 97 plan had a whole new uh, targeting helmet. But more importantly, it was night vision compatible, and it had a new data link system, so on and so forth. And these started to come out in 2000. Also in 1999, the engines were updated. They went from the Mark 104 to the more modern Mark 106. And then, instead of just calling these 96 and 97s, they, they introduced the names GR3 and GR3A. So basically it was there to just increase the capability, allow it to take more equipment, and to really update it for the modern digital age. And of course they took the opportunity to conduct um, several uh, airframe service extensions. They would also pick 11 of the 14 T2As updating them to T4 standard, which was essentially giving the same new avionics and, and whatnot from the GR3 program. So they are updating their fleet. And by the time of what's known as the War on Terror in late 2001-2002, this whole process is, uh, is well underway. This one here is kind of in the uh, Kind of in clean configuration, I guess you would say. Empty pylons. It it does come with a center line tank. But that was kind of the new role. It, it could still, still definitely be for ground attack, but there was more emphasis put on the ability to operate a reconnaissance pod. And of course, these are aging out now. But they still think they have at least one more major use opportunity. In 2003, with the uh, coalition invasion of Iraq that March, the RAF laid out plans to use the new GR3 3A, and they were planning to fly them out of uh, bases in Turkey. But I guess they didn't act asked the Turkish government because they objected. It was a much more controversial war than the 91. So even though the Jaguar was to be used there, this never came to fruition. So it stayed at home. Then in 2004, now that the Eurofighter is finally coming online and with plenty of tornadoes and um, harriers it's decided to go ahead and schedule the Jaguar's final retirement for October of 2007. Other aircraft can take over its roles. The Harrier has become a very capable ground attack close air support aircraft thanks to the Harrier 2 system. The Tornado is a good strike aircraft, and as for reconnaissance, there's plenty of options there, including uh, drones and satellites. So, it was scheduled for retirement, so it had final flights and whatnot for a few years. As it turns out, though, the retirement was bumped up slightly to April of 2007.
and with that, the remaining airframes were retired. But of course, at this point, they're decades old, so they they got their money's worth out of what was originally meant to be an interim aircraft. This one here, this GR3, it's a little more kitted out. It's got the fuel tanks. I put a couple of sidewinders on because why not? What are these on top? I assume they're a type of a ECM, you know, defensive emitter. Because I know there's only a couple of things that can be on the uh, upper pylons here. The missiles or a few types of electronics. So if anyone knows, let me let me know. I couldn't find anywhere that mentioned, but that's kind of an assumption, which would make sense for defense and this type of an aircraft late in its uh, service life. And uh, France had already retired its Jaguars a couple of years earlier in 2005. So with that, it was pretty much the end of a Cold War legacy. And to uh, wrap things up, I actually put these out in the order I acquired them. The T4 was actually my first. I got this from uh, Pete's a while back. And as it turns out, Corgi doesn't do many T4s, so I'm glad I got it. They do have a few T2s, but there's not a lot of difference at all between a T4 and a T2. And I was pretty happy with this. But I thought, well, let's get a let's get a single seater. And I kind of was figuring out to get something with uh, bombs, at least optional ordnance. So, obviously not being able to see pictures, I ordered this one. And it was a good price. It was on sale. And uh, I think this one came from Aikens. And it came with basically nothing. <laughs> it came with a, a centerline tank. That's because it's kind of more in a recce configuration. And I like it. It's I like having reconnaissance or even just clean versions of aircraft. And I thought, well, okay, I've got a, a single seat, a two-seater. Didn't really think much of it beyond that. But then this one popped up. Had a little bit more going on. The, the pods on top, the, the fuel tanks. It was also on sale. And then I added the uh, side winders just because I wanted some kind of ordinance. It's just me. And I was pretty content with these. But then last year, Corgi announced this new one. For one thing, I'd been wanting a GR1. Because my first three were newer patterns. And for another, I figured being the motorways trial one, it would come with bombs. And it did. And it has the four plus the center line tank. It's funny because the bombs are removable. When I first got it, they were in a little package and I didn't notice it. And I thought, oh crap, when I got it, I was like, there's no ordinance on this either. My luck continues. But then I found them and that made things kind of neat. And I really was content there. Because then I had an early one, plus it had bombs. But then during Aiken's Christmas cleanup, <laughs> warehouse cleanup and sale, this one got released. They found one of these. And at first I didn't I didn't buy it. Kind of looked at it and thought, you know, I don't need another Jaguar. Even though it, I knew it would have armament because it's from Desert Storm and because it's from Operation Grand B, I thought that was kind of historically neat. And it was a 1A. But I waffled on it several times. But eventually I just caved, picked it up on Christmas Eve or something. And I'm really glad I did because it's kind of what I was wanting. I really wanted one that had the over the wings missiles because it's just a unique, <laughs> unique look. And the fact that it's fully loaded below with uh, the kind of tandem double bomb mounts that that's neat and then the the uh, ch uh chaff and flare pods and what have you fully kitted out one that's for sure and it matches my other british desert storm aircraft 
And yeah, this gives me a, uh, a GR1, GR1A, GR3, and GR3A, plus a T4. And I have a, you know, bomber roll, reconnaissance roll, testing, and uh, training down here. So a pretty widespread look at British Jaguars. So which one do you like best? Let me know. I just felt like revisiting the Jaguar. It's a cold, rainy old day. Still waiting for FedEx. I appreciate you hanging out with me for a bit. If you could, like, share, and subscribe. This is Misha, and I'll catch you very soon. Next time.